Hey everybody, Nerd in Texoma here. It is officially New Year's Day as I'm filming this. So, uh, hope y'all enjoyed your New Year's Eve festivities. If y'all took part in any, hopefully y'all were safe. No injuries, no craziness. I mean, there's going to be craziness, but nothing extreme to injure yourself or others or do any harm. Uh, like I say, hopefully y'all are all alright and not watching this from a hospital room. If you are watching from a hospital room, speedy recovery. I am going to be talking today about a movie that I got a while back, and as you can see, I'm out in the living room because I wanted to watch this on the TV out there. Uh, this movie is something that I never knew about until recently. Um, there's an upcoming movie, I believe it's supposed to be in theaters... Uh, actually this Friday, the 6th, called Megan. It's about a robotic android personal companion that this scientist makes for her daughter because she's lonely because they moved to a new town, so something like that. I don't know exactly everything about that movie. I want to see it, but I don't you know, know all the backstory yet on it, so, <coughs> but somebody was saying that that movie was actually based on an 80s movie from the director of Nightmare on Elm Street there, and he's done a lot of other things in his career. His name's Wes Craven. And he made a movie called Deadly Friend that was based on a book that came out about two years before he made the movie just called Friend. And I've heard the original book doesn't exactly line up with Wes Craven's movie. He took liberties and... You know, movies do that all the time. When do movies or TV show adaptations of books line up with the book? Very rarely. But, being that this is a long weekend, I actually finally had the chance to sit down and watch Deadly Friend by Wes Craven. And basically, yeah, they say it's twisted terror. Eh, I wouldn't exactly call it terror, in my opinion. Uh, the terror is the fact that I spent ten bucks on this DVD, and is probably, in my opinion, probably worth about three. <laughs> I mean, it's not that it's a bad movie, per se, but it's just a very 80s movie. Uh, I mean, if y'all can find it for cheap, pick it up. Don't spend 10 bucks on it like me. I know it's out of print. I know it's been out of production for a couple of years. Not worth ten bucks, in my opinion. Unless you're a Wes Craven completionist and you have to have everything that he's made. Yeah, go for it then. But, eh. Stream it online if you can. If you can, I'm not sure if it's on any uh, streaming services or anything like that. But if it's on the streaming service that you subscribe to... Watch it there. You know, if it's on whatever, the YouTube movies or whatever they call it, watch it there. Don't 
spend 10 bucks on it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's decent, but eh. Uh, the basic story in this movie is that this really brilliant teen is moving to a new town with his mom and he has created I guess you would say an advanced AI robotic helper friend type device <clears throat> he's kind of a nerdy one he should be in high school but he's really in college <coughs> excuse me for the coughing you know because he's already surpassed all he all his knowledge of high school and stuff like that and uh he doesn't really have any friends in this new town he makes friends with the local paper boy uh, and he makes friends with the girl who lives next door. Yeah, typical 80s stuff. Uh, the twist is... The girl who lives next door, her father is quite abusive to her. <sighs> well, one day he's out with his friends and comes across the... Local punks, you know, that ride their dirt bikes all over town and terrorize people and stuff like that. They get in a fight, and his robot buddy comes to save him. You know, the next day they're out playing basketball in the street, and their basketball goes over the fence of the mean lady across the street. And she keeps the basketball and, you know, oh, darn you kids and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And a couple days later, they're trying to get into her fence for Halloween to be the first people who can trick or treat at her house in decades and stuff like that. Well, they're doing all that. They pick the lock on her fence and uh, send the robot in to do the trick-or-treating and she blasts it away with her shotgun so the robot's gone the robot's name is BB and it's yellow now to a lot of people that might not mean anything but to me in my mind, it links together because I think this movie came out in 85, 86-ish. In 84, the Transformers came out. And their cute little friendly robot that the Autobots had was named Bumblebee. BB. And he was a cute little Volkswagen Beetle and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. And he's yellow. Two years later, or a year later, whatever, here's this movie with this robot named BB. And he's a cute little robot that's yellow. I may be reading into that. I don't know. That's just how my mind works. Well, anyhow, uh, BB is destroyed. He's not repairable. So Paul, the super smart kid, pulls out his brain chip, basically, before he sends the body off to the junkyard or recycles into the next Campbell soup can or something. I don't know what happens to the robot's body. And he, like I said, he pulls out the brain chip and keeps it on his dresser in his room and stuff like that. Well, things progress and uh, his next door neighbor, the girl, Sam, keeps on sneaking back over to his house. 
Uh, her dad catches her sneaking back into her house. And he confronts her and as she's going into her room and he confronts her and he's like, you weren't over there studying, blah, 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 blah. And he smacks her in her face and she falls down the stairs and hits her head on the wall, which puts her in a coma where she's basically brain dead. So the hospital says, you know, well, nothing we can do. Uh, make your preparations, your final choices for her, and let's say 24 hours from now, we're going to pull the plug. Okay, you know, typical, strange Hollywood writing and plotline, you know, I mean, eh. You know, why they gave 24 hours, why they didn't sit there and say, well, let's see, a month down the line or something like that. I don't know. But, anyhow, 24 hours passes. Actually, 23, because there was some reasoning, I forget why, but the hospital decided to pull a plug on her at 9 o'clock instead of 10 o'clock. Anyhow, Paul and his buddy, Tom, the newspaper delivery guy, Tom comes up, I mean, Paul comes up with a plan to implant BB's brain chip into Sam's brain to try to revitalize her and bring her brain functions back online. So to do this... He enlists Tom's help to break into the hospital and get Sam's body from the morgue and take her home so he can implant the chip. He actually takes her to his uh, college, uh, I don't know what the word is for it. Uh, exam room or something because he's a neuroscientist they take her body over to the college implant the brain chip and then take her back to Paul's house and he stashes her in the garage she starts coming back to life using BB's brain chip. She is very robotic in her actions. She is not the same person that she was before. She barely talks. Her movements are very robotic. Uh, when she walks, <laughs> this is one of the funniest things to me. When she walks at you, her hands are always in the live long and prosper configuration but like this you know or like some fingers will be curled but her hand is always like this both hands well things basically don't go as planned and I guess somehow BB's brain chip that got implanted in her head is like, hey, I've got to go back and get revenge on these people that harmed me. So, Sam starts going back and killing all the people that have hurt her in town. She starts with her dad, then the mean old lady across the street. Then the uh, the final kill really is, and it's not even really a kill, is uh, the dirt bike punk's leader. And then, you know, she finally, I guess, the chip starts 
blending in with her brain more or something or somehow she's able to access more of her memories rather than BB's memories and near the end of the movie she starts exerting her personality more and you know sees Paul and all this but the local police are around swarming because you know they all they know is that, hey this dead girl came back and she's killing people across town what's going on ah! so yeah the end of the movie the police end up accidentally shooting her and killing her a second time this time actually shooting her in the heart and the movie ends <laughs> with Paul hatching a plan once again to bring Sam back from the dead so he sneaks into the morgue by himself this time to steal her body once again, I'm guessing to implant an artificial heart or something. But when he gets to the morgue, opens up the drawer or bay or whatever it's called where her body is, he opens it up and she's like, oh... Paul, I've missed you, something like that. So she's already kind of halfway back alive, but then she, like, reaches up to start strangling him, and you see her skin starts falling off, and underneath is BB. And then that's how the movie ends, and it's like, is that last bit supposed to be a dream sequence, or is that supposed to be what actually happens, or what? I mean, you know, I'm sorry if I spoiled the movie for anybody, but this is one that is so obscure that I don't think anybody's really like, oh my gosh, you know, it's... It's like Avengers when they told me what was going to happen at Endgame and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't honestly think any of y'all are going to be offended by my synopsis of what actually happens in this movie. Because, yeah, probably most of y'all, like I said, unless you're a Wes Craven fan and have to have every bit of his work that he's ever done, I doubt most of y'all are even going to have any knowledge or connection or want to see this movie. Like I say, it's not bad, but it is, if that makes sense. It's horribly, horribly dated, in my opinion. There is shit for a soundtrack, because usually in, like, these scary movies and horror movies and stuff like that, they'll have some actual songs in it, you know, some actual music from a band or something. This has none of that. This is just all instrumental. And I'm not saying that you can't have a movie or a TV show that's just instrumental for the soundtrack, but... I, I just can't recommend it. I mean, like I say, it's... The only major name connected to this movie, aside from Wes Craven, is Christy Swanson. And y'all will recognize her. Uh, that's supposed to be Christy Swanson, but it doesn't really look like her in my opinion. Uh, most of y'all will recognize her from uh, a movie that she did, say, this was 85, 86, something like that. Uh, 
about five years after this, the original movie Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know, this has the original Buffy in it, before the TV series. So, I guess to see where she kind of got her start, if you wouldn't want to say that, you know, it's worth it for that, but... Eh, like I say, if you can pick it up for cheap, if you're a Wes Craven collector or Wes Craven fan, if you can find it online for free on some sort of ser streaming service, watch it. Other than that, save your money. But I will talk to y'all later. Like I say, this is Deadly Friends, not worth 10 bucks. <laughs> All right, y'all. Nerd in Texoma. Take it easy. Be good. Have a good new year. You know, if you make the uh, traditional resolutions, I hope you can meet them. If you don't and you just kind of go through the year and see where it takes you, I hope it takes you to good places this year. Be good. See you all in the next video. Bye.